So this is part of a series of films we're putting out on the topic of mediation, which has been called the hard problem of the culture war, mediating between the different warring tribes. And this film is a kind of exploratory dialogue with two good friends of the channel. Diane Musho Hamilton, who's a Zen priest and mediator, and Peter Lindbergh, who first introduced the topic of mimetic mediators in the film we put out earlier this year called Culture War 2.0. How do we mediate amongst all these warring tribes? And I view mimetic mediation as the hard problem of culture war 2.0. In referencing the blind man and the elephant, how do we get all these blind men uh, to talk to each other? So the exciting thing that I find about mimetic mediation is it's an open conversation. It's an open discussion on what exactly it is what mindset is needed in order to adopt it, and what kind of techniques and tools can we use to go about it. So we had a really wide-ranging conversation covering all sorts of topics like how do you make mediation sexy? The tension by its nature, if you will, is sexy. There's two. That, you know, a fight is far sexier than, you know, than two people talking about everything they can agree about if we're just talking in terms of enlivened, awakened life force. You know, so a conflict is always going to wake people up and keep people excited. And ha so how do we make that coming together? How do we make the soothingness of coming together as appealing as the attention getting of conflict? That's one, one question that interests me. And we ended up in a really unexpected but interesting place at the end of the conversation. I think that's really landing for me is that that point exactly um, getting better at conflict and Propositional violence, if you will, will help you be better mediator. And so being good at argumentation or good enough at it is a humbling experience, which might connect to being good at the mediation. I'd love to start um, maybe for each of us to talk about why we think this is such a crucial and complex issue. Um, maybe starting with, with you, Diane. I know you've been doing this work for an awfully long time. I would say that the reason that it's becoming more challenging certainly in the United States is that I think culture is genuinely diversifying. It's always been diverse. You know, we've always had a high influx, um, particularly at different periods of history of immig immigration. We've had subcultures of uh, different people from around the world, but there has always been a sort of predominant uh, Judeo-Christian meaning making system, certain group, group, you know, of people who've been in governance and so as we genuinely diversify, those, the, the, the diversification in some ways and the complexity that comes from the diversification makes it more difficult to find where we're genuinely unified. And given that different cultures, you could say different meaning making systems value different, different values are primary, um, it becomes harder to join around any fixed set of values. You know, you can take even for instance, the, the value of equality that comes out of modernism so powerfully, and then the value of empathy that really emerges with postmodernism and, and we're talking past one another. You know? um, so I think the diversification of culture and the complexity of culture, and then I think that you, as, you, as you well know, and you both have talked about a lot, is the, the media environment. I mean, in which um, you could say that the the, 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 it's even a, an enhanced diversity because there's opportunity for people's voice to be online. There's no editing function. There's no channeling function towards commonality or towards consensus. Um, and that it actually re rewards, as we know, fringe, the more fringe thinking, the more the algorithms reward that. So I think the combination of, of the genuine complexity that and that globalization is also part of and then you know infuse that with you know media and we just have a tremendous amount of the diversity is is very powerful but it's difficult to find unity and the complexity is often overwhelming so we find comfort in very small affinity groups or smaller cultures and then I guess the last thing I would say is just that I think there's natural tension always in the course of the evolution of culture between the preserving function the looking backward towards something more stable and known and the looking forward to something new and that, that the, the gap between, you might say, progressive culture that's trying to move towards a new future and not regressive, but pre the preserving function of the universe is trying to preserve something that seems to be going 
away and that that's even more polarized right now. So those are, those are some of the things I think I would say. Yeah. I echo everything Diane just said. Um, and to answer your question, uh, like personally, why I got interested in mediation or what I termed mimetic mediation, the culture war was really a, a response to existential loneliness that I felt like I didn't feel understood. Um, and like as someone who has intellectual proclivities, like, you know, I had a desire to be understood with my ideas, with my mind. Um, and then just seeing like having like an abuse of interpretation of, of what I was saying uh, and it created deep loneliness for me. Um, mm. So that's sort of how I got interested in it personally. And the other thing I would add to everything Diane just said is that the fear that mimetic violence turns to kinetic violence, essentially, um, how the culture war turns into like a civil war, a real war. war. Mm -hmm. And when I was coming into this conversation, like three sort of kind of questions have been alive for me for, for a while now in, in terms of mediation is how can we create a culture of mediation? Um, and maybe adjacent questions, how to, how to make mediation sexy? You know, like, how, how do we get, want, want people to like do it, not feel like obligated to do it or like, you know, um, compassion signaling that they're, they're doing it or whatever. Um, and uh, the other question is um, how to outsource the, uh, the skill set and the talent stack of a mediator. Wow. There's so many great questions already. Um, yeah, the, the, the thing that comes up immediately or reminds me of, of something, I, I just had an interview earlier today with Helena puig Lorori of Build Up. And Build Up were looking, they're working in places like Somalia, they're working in places like Syria and looking at conflict mediation in, in war zones. And then she told the story about what happened in 2016. A lot of, they have a lot of Americans on the team and they looked, they were saying, we're seeing the same thing happening in America that we would consider warning signs if we were seeing it anywhere else. And the two key things that she talked about was that they were seeing identity being framed in a way that excluded or demonized others and arguments being created in a such a way that were closed and fixed, which I thought was a really interesting sort of set of, um, yeah, that that, that is, is a prelude to kine kinetic violence, that once you've got that dynamic, and I think as, as you both pointed out, the idea that we're in an environment with social media that seems to reward and feed that kind of dynamic in itself is, is, part, is partly why I think we're in a, in a new place. That's part of the sort of why now answer, I think. And I, right. I'll just say a, a small thing related to that, uh, David, that was what Peter also mentioned in, in relationship to how can mediation be sexy. I mean, I think it's important to know that, you know, in terms of just simply physics, that when when there is when there are when two, there are two, there's two poles, there's tension. So whenever we have conflict difference or conflict, there is energy running along that we come together, there's a relaxation that happens in the system and we feel good and we feel open and it's a quality of kind of oneness or wholeness or hominess or togetherness or whatever. But as soon as there starts to be division, we get very alert in relationship to that. Um, humans are very, very sensitive to when there's tension in the system and we're on high alert, but it doesn't mean that we always know how to react in relationship to that tension. So the tension by its nature, if you will, is sexy. There's two that, you know, a fight is far sexier than you know, then two people talking about everything they can agree about if we're just talking in terms of enlivened, awakened life force, you know. So a conflict is always going to wake people up and keep people excited. And ha so how do we make that coming together? How do we make the soothingness of coming together as appealing as the attention getting of conflict? That's one, one question that interests me, like really helping people see that. The, physi the physiological differences, particularly in groups that happen around coming together, that happen around conflict. Something that just came up, I'd love for, to hear your response to that, Peter, but something that just came up for me when you're saying, Diane, it's like in sport, you have the sexiness of conflict, but it's held within a context of the rules of the game, the fair play. Exactly. Like that's, 
So it's almost like the context that's missing that we've kind of stripped yes. away because we've got this sort of winner takes all culture now. Yeah, I was, I was going to say exactly that. Um, and I, but first, I, I, I love the idea of like um, mediation or that conflict is already sexy and kinky. Uh, and I think that is like yeah. part of the, the solution, having that sort of um, that frame. Um, and yeah, like in that paper I wrote for the side view, I said mimetic mediation is the hard problem of the culture war. And then the argument simply there is that in order to mediate, you got to have two people wanting to, you know, mediate and people don't want this. Uh, they just want to argue. And then the, there's an ecology out there that social media ecology out there that supports that. Um, and so the question that's alive for me is that like what you're saying, uh, David, the, the container of where that sexy conflict happens, that mediation happens, how do, how can that be made attractive? How can that be made sexy to get people coming in to actually want to talk and, 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 and have conflict? I, I've had a little bit of thought about that. And, uh, you know, I think, I think there's, I really want to acknowledge the research, David, that you and your crew have been doing around this question, because you have the paper that you're putting together that has lots of good resources that are, for people that are holding dialogues. But I think a model that could be good for culture would be, for instance, if we wanted to have a discussion around race, let's say, as opposed to politics right now, you know, the two places where we see people interacting constantly and, and in a, in a way these dialogues would be super powerful because they would galvanize huge audiences or musicians and athletes. Like I would love, I'd love more than anything to create a container, you know, in the NBA to talk about race that other people could watch and participate with and see modeled for them what a, what a great conversation would be like because there's already so much in common and there's already so much that people do well together that there, there's, there's this basis of commonality that's already there, you know, and then you have that, that kind of conversation. So I would tend to go towards cultures that already have really kind of powerful working relationships that need to learn how to have the conversations, you know, because they work together on the field or when they're playing jazz or whatever it is. And that's, to me, that would be super interesting. It's like, what are the places where there's potentiality for that? And it wouldn't take much to galvanize it. That is something I've thought about. And the, and which by its very nature would draw a large audience because who doesn't want to hear LeBron talk about this, you know? I mean, one of the dynamics that I've become increasingly aware of just looking at the kind of idea space or the, the kind of intellectual landscape is how difficult it is for people in the public eye to do this kind of work or to, to, to admit that we're wrong, to, to kind of go through the process of thinking in public. Like I've seen, um, sort of been tracking d different, different sort of, um, movements or different intellectuals since sort of 2016, 2018, and it's so rare. And it seems to be part of, I've almost seen like a hardening of positions. And I look at something like Twitter and the way that that sort of reinforces, you almost see that these camps are sort of marked out and policed in real time. There's something about the sort of tribal nature of it. And then the outskirts of those arguments get policed. You've got the the, the way that certain behaviors seem to be rewarded and actually a nuanced attempt to, to reach mediation doesn't seem to be rewarded, which I guess we're sort of getting back to the kind of how do you make it sexy idea? And can you even make it sexy at all on something like on, on the social media platforms? Yeah, what's, what's coming up is um, in that white paper on the culture war, um, in the speculative proposal section, we, we had this idea of having sense-making debates and um, sports debates. Uh, and like kind of currently passes off debates. It's like a, like a mix of, of, of both where it's like has this pretense that they're like debating for the truth, but they're really just sort of um, gesturing towards their tribe. What uh, Robert Talese and Scott Aikens calls the dialectic fallacy. There's like a pretense of they're actually engaging in dialogue, but they're just signaling uh, uh, to, their, to their, their tribal members and with their shibboleths and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And this idea of like bifurcating those two, where you have like a sense-making debate and this idea that um, uh, of the anti-debate you know, could we, we like gamify Carl Rogers active listening or empathy circles or whatever, and then make it like a Trojan horse with the debate lingo 
bring two people in, but then design in a way where you um, put emphasis on understanding over winning or being right. Um, and then the other one, the sports debate is there is a desire to just like win an argument, you know, like just that fight or flight response and like rap battles come to mind. You know, it's like you have this aggression, but you take it out in the realm of propositions, but it's framed that you're not really here for the truth and the truth might bleed out, but it's sort of like a UFC of the mind. And so like going with that frame, you might get that aggression out. Um, and I sense if there's like kind of like this entrepreneurial mindset that we can have with this, something could take off if celebrities take on it and whatnot. And that could just sidestep the danger of doing this on a platform like Twitter or, or Facebook or whatnot. In the, in the facilitation work that I do often, the, the tribal work or the tribal virtue signaling to your own tribe, you know, I always talk about it as the, as the loyalty test, because one of the things that makes it difficult in, in larger groups is as soon as you start to somehow empathize or even just simply receive the opinions or the perspectives of the other side, you're betraying your own people. It's always a problem in negotiation. You know, whenever we negotiate, how, how do we send people back to their own tribe and get their support for what the negotiators did, you know? So in some ways, um, I think that it's interesting to change the rules of engagement. And, and it would have to be, in my mind, something around really allowing the differences to flower and blossom and let people experience sort of the, almost like the height of the difference. And then, then notice when when it starts to flip and when you naturally find yourself picking up the other side, because it inevitably always happens. You know, when I work in a group, group of people, there might be a polarity. Let's say the polarity is around something like who's working hardest, you know, the people who are working hard and the people who aren't. Inevitably, the people who are accused of not working hard will suddenly pick up the side that they need other people to work more. Like it flips. It's just, it's almost like a uh, a natural phenomenon that if you allow a conflict to blossom in the linguistic, at least in the kind of linguistic domain, that inevitable, you know, you'll you'll see where all of a sudden one side that was representing one thing will now be representing the opposite and vice versa. And you can actually just pay attention to that. And then that flexibility of mind starts to set in. So it is true that people will often hold back and cluster in the group because the conflict's so threatening. Right. But if they had safety enough to let the conflicts really come out fully and then watched for when they felt themselves switch sides, like actually give permission to have the experience that, oh, my God, I just took the other side, you know, but it requires a certain amount of uh, trust. It requires the right container and the right set of objectives, as you're saying. It's not necessarily about truth. It's about um really letting the perspectives fill out so fully that they become their opposite. I have a question for Diane. Um, actually, something's coming up when you were, you were talking. So at a, a previous session of the STOA, which is a communal podcast, so a bunch of people are talking uh, in, in the same Zoom room. Um, someone was talking about, uh, uh, it's an older gentleman, he was talking about Trump supporters. And he says, uh, we, we did everything. We, we told them what's true. And even some of the enlightened amongst us uh, were listening. Right? And I was like, dude, and like, no. <laughs> um, in, in a way, it's like the weaponization of mediation techniques, right? Like yes. that right there, he was instrumentalizing listening in order yeah. to change their mind because he already knew it was right. Yep. Um, and yep. I'm not, I don't have mediation experience, but I'm a corporate mm -hmm. trainer. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I'm a trainer at Dale Carnegie Training. So I, I have mm -hmm. this kind of like... Yeah. You these certain well. tools. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like, you want to listen in such a way that you get transformed yourself. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious if you have a sort of like a taxonomy of listening and, and how you teach it and how you let other people kind of um, listen in a way that will have that transformative effect. Well, I, 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 I usually teach listening as, uh, as a communication skill that's a little bit secondary to understanding the nature of unity and diversity and the nature of sameness and difference in the human nervous system and how sameness is the relaxation response and people meditate to experience unity. They meditate to experience themselves as one with all things, right? That's fundamental. But evolution happens through diversification. That's what evolution is. It's the diversification of what is the same. And so listening is a practice in becoming the same. 
Right. So what, in what moments do we need togetherness? What is our purpose of that? When are we allowed to differ? How do we understand and heighten that difference? So listening as a skill always creates, it always soothes. It always creates uh, relaxation because there's no, there's no opposition. You're coming together. You're becoming one. When, when one person relinquishes their views and listens and joins, um, we merge. And when people merge, usually there's relaxation that happens. So the question I would always have is in the course of the conversation, when is that sameness needed and why? And then when do we heighten, differentiate, experience creative tension, experience potential conflict, feel ourselves excited in ways with adrenaline and you know, cortisol and, and feel groups and individuals literally get excited to the point they feel threatened, you know? So for me, it's always, it's always within this understanding that we grow through difference and we cohere and deepen through sameness and listening is a sameness skill. So there are many, that. but that's one. Yeah. And it's like, you're, you're building a relationship with the state. Yes. That, that, that delicious state you get when you're yes. really listening to someone and understanding. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that so much of what we do in mediation is cognitive when in fact, a lot of people's experience is physiological. And, it, and David and I have talked a lot about, I, I do see some of the cutting edge work in mediation, not unrelated to trauma work in that it's very somatic in nature and that we have to work with the human body, you know, um, as part of it. Yeah. There's something that I think. And I can feel you both listening to me. Like it's having an impact that I am sharing some excitement about this and that you're both receiving me and that it's a very powerful felt sense right now. You know, I don't feel that I need to continue to assert something because I can already feel that it's being received. Yeah, and I think a lot of the, the people I spoke to talked about the, the necessity for, you can break things down as skills, but you have to have the mindset. You have to have the the willingness or the desire to enter into it in the first place, which, which, is, which calls back a little bit to Peter's question about uh, talking about sort of the, the, the guy sharing, oh, well, I've even listened to Trump supporters and like it's coming from a place of judgment. It's coming from a place of I want you to change. And that's a question that I've had throughout this, this kind of research process because mediation as a, as a topic seems to show up more on one side of the political spectrum than the other. Apart from something like Braver Angels, which is quite unique because they have a deliberate uh, and very conscious split all the way along between red and blue. Like they, they have equal numbers all the way through. It tends to be that these organizations that are doing mediation in conflict zones and then coming, there's a very strong liberal bias. And that, as we've talked about quite a lot, can show up as a way of Yes, I'm entering mediation, but I'm entering mediation to change these bigoted people on the other side. And, and that for me is like one of the real issues here is that how do, you, how do you even begin when the whole topic of mediation seems to attract one, whether that's a temperamental category, oh, it, it tends to attract people who are higher in openness. Therefore, as per Jonathan Haidt's work, it's people who are more likely to be liberal rather than conservative but it also can attract people who, yes, they want to enter mediation, but secretly they want to enter mediation because they want other people to, they've already got judgments that they want other people to change. Like that seems to be one of the trickiest problems. Yeah, it is. It's, it's literally one of the reasons that I um, was introduced to Ken Wilber's work somehow, you know, in one of those sort of synchronistic kind of ways where, in my own work, so 20 years ago, when I was working for the judiciary in Utah, and we were engaged in uh, a racial and ethnic fairness um, evaluation, and uh, we, we created a task force to look at racial and ethnic fairness in the criminal justice system 20 years ago. And as part of that, I facilitated a lot of conversations related to racism, race bias, those kinds of kinds of questions. And at that time, I started to see these tremendous differences in how people 
engage the conversation. And I start, I think I told you, David, I used Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's stages of grief. It just, a stage model came up where I saw people in denial. I saw people enraged. I see, saw people who seemed to have kind of cut a deal with the system that was working for them. I saw people who were sad and I saw people who were free. And these free people could seem to be able to occupy other states and other perspectives. But at the end of the day, we're still refreshed at the end of the day, continue to advocate at the end of the day, weren't threatened when they were challenged at the end of the day. And I was like, what is going on here? I mean, that, that was really when I started. And I started to see that my own approach to mediation was in some ways quite naive in the sense that I sort of presumed that if you create the right environment and you frame the questions properly and you get the substantive issues on the table and you create options for those substantive, substantive issues that create win-wins, that everybody's gonna be able to negotiate equally. And it just wasn't the case. And that's when this stage model came into my mind. And then I was introduced to Ken's work three, literally within a month, three weeks, I think somebody had turned me on to, and then he started to explain these, these worldviews and how they chunk out through human development. And one of the things that really happens at pluralism is that we really start wanting to hear more and more differing perspectives. And we want marginalized voices to begin to be heard and, and prior to that, we don't. Prior to that, at earlier stages where things are more concrete and one up, one down dynamics are still quite inherent in how we view the world. And it is, it is hard. Now we can say that a pluralistic worldview that wants mediation and wants multiple perspectives is better. It's not better, um, but it is, di and it is different. And how do you bridge that? And I think the question you're asking, asking about both of you about mimetic mediation is right to the point because when worldviews are so different and one's way of actually thinking about the world, not just your value set, but your, your, your literal meaning-making system is constituted differently. How does one work with that? I think it's a, it is exactly, Peter, the right question to be asking. You know, so how do we do that? And I don't know the answer except to pose the question and start to explore it in the way we are. One thing is, is, is coming up uh, and circling back to the... Um making mediation sexy uh, is marketing, <laughs> essentially. Um, mm -hmm. that, that delicious uh, felt sense quality that you described when you feel really deeply understood, the word mediation does not have monopoly of that state. You know, that, that container, that concept of mediation. And, and like mimetic mediation, we were talking about this, David, it's kind of a dorky term. <laughs> it's not, I don't, I don't see it's gonna go viral and everyone's like, oh, let's be mimetic mediators. Um, but maybe there's like, a, there's different ways to attract people into dialogue, into conversation that mm -hmm. uh, allows them to arrive at that state. Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't have to be necessarily framed as this is a mediation thing. Um, Cause I do find like, like you were saying earlier, David, when, it's framed as like, okay, here's compassionate dialogue or this or that. It attracts a certain people with certain bias. Um, mm -hmm. and, and everyone's already coming to a place of wanting to agree and they already agree with each other and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, but and this is why that Dan's earlier point about m making kind of like it hype a little bit, having kind of a, a, some production to it, attract big names, um, make it a show. Uh, maybe that will attract certain people. Um, and then uh, having a more uh, classic mediation frame will attract others. Something just came up when you were speaking about, um, when I was speaking to John Wood Jr. of Braver Angels, he talked about the, so they do in-person workshops, and he actually talked about those in-person workshops as a peak experience, which is something that I guess we'd be familiar with from, from other, other um, like, yeah, we, we've talked about this, this in the past. Like, and he, I wonder what the relationship is between that sort of, that peak experience that I know, and maybe we've all experienced at the end of a workshop or at the end of some kind of deep transformational process, that sort of real kind of feeling of intensity and, and connection and uh, dropping into something deeper that kind of sounds like a cliche or sounds kind of meaningless unless you've actually experienced it. And I was really interested in, in that because you would imagine like conducting conducting workshops between sort of red and blue would be a very sort of prosaic thing. But the way you talked about it made me think of, yeah, made me think of, of different sort of transformational practices and how that, that maybe becomes that feeling of, of unity or connection that you get in those environments then can become a bit of an attractor. Um, and it's difficult if you've not had that experience to know, like once, I know for example, doing workshops or 
um, having those experiences for me became something I, I, I started seeking for in my life and making a real priority. Um, and, and I wonder if there's a relationship between that sort of sense of peak experience or sense of transformative experience that then becomes a strange attractor for people to seek out um, more of. And then also playing with sort of the framing of things, uh, sort of viewing the culture war as an opportunity for psychotherapy in a way. Mm -hmm. um, I mused on this in one of my recent letters, uh, uh, journals that, you know, people, this is like a crude assessment, but people on the left have daddy issues, people on the right have mommy issues. Um, and then certain sort of terms or buzzwords have a certain triggering quality. And if you have the frame that, okay, I'm, I'm being triggered, but this is an opportunity for self growth, uh, for that kind of, uh, that, and then there's peak experiences that come with inching your way to individuation. Um, so that's something I'm also toying with the idea that the cultural mediation itself can serve as, um, a catalyst for growth. I, I could see also David, like in your, in your, I mean, training people in these skills, giving them opportunities to, to disagree, to differ, to conflict, to get used to those embodied states, then giving them the experience of what is it like when you actually achieve a state of, of genuine unity, that deep, satisfying, and can be quite effervescent quality as part of that training to me, seems like it would be a very powerful attractor. I think another example right now might be where I don't think the peak experience would be such an attractor, but the, the sense of shared mission would be. So I could imagine right now a, a place where this could really be applied would be in the Biden administration, where you don't simply go into these government, government agencies and overthrow the culture, the preceding culture. You go into the government agencies and you actually do some sort of this mimetic mediation where you, you know, you, you have to do a certain amount of cultivating around the vision and what it is people do well together and what they've managed to do well together. And then where do they diverge and really support that divergence, really support the fact that let's say in, I don't know what it would be NHS or something, but well, just whatever it happens to be, maybe it's, maybe it's environmental preservation, maybe it isn't, you know, and that those, that, that difference is really supported and both sides are really held to have a truth. And then somehow they're the longing to actually be able to get along with each other is somehow supported. And then, you know, somehow that's woven, like that would be a place where there's such a need for something like this, because all that's going to happen if we do it in the other way is we're going to just simply impose one culture on top of the other. And there's going to be, you know, this coping, 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 and then it's going to flip. And then there's, and, and all of that is just degrading the coherence of the overall operation. I mean, I can't imagine what, what could happen in right now, what's happening in the national security industry, for instance, knowing that, all the values that you've been working with are going to be completely replaced by an utterly different set of values, different leaders, different world, different goals, different everything. Like it's super inefficient in terms of just energy, life force, people's creativity, their bonding. Like I can't imagine working for in the U.S. a government agency right now and having to deal with this change in the administration. I just can't. And and it seems like it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. So it's not a place where I see that the peak experience might draw those people, but the, the longing to get along around this shared enterprise of running your department, whatever it happens to be, is a very big thing, you know? So I don't know if that addressed what you were saying, David, around the, just that really powerful state experience that one gets through transformational. But the training, I could totally see having that component. Yeah, I guess I was thinking whether that, yeah, that sort of peak experience could be part of the sort of making it sexy conversation. And yeah. one other thing that comes up is whether, so like mediating the culture war may not be something that attracts everyone, but surely what, I mean, one, one link that everyone would recognize is a breakdown of relationships, difficulty in relationships, like steering into disagreement in our intimate relationships, steering into disagreement in um, getting on with the people around us. So I wonder if there's a link there in terms of making it, making it relevant, making it um, something that 
is clearly necessary for all of us. Um, and maybe, maybe not sort of, I mean, I hear a lot of people talking about kind of teaching it in schools, but I think it would have to be made a little bit more attractive and sexy for people to pick it up when they're kind of in later life. Well, part of that, in my mind, Peter, tell me what you think about this. Part of that in my mind is that this deeper recognition of how satisfying unity is and this deeper recognition of how exciting fighting is. Mm. When I used to, when I used to teach at the University of Utah, I taught a couple of mediation courses at the law school and also in the, in the communications department. And I would always do it. We'd, do, we'd explore your conflict style. You know, there's sort of three basic styles. There's the avoidant, the accommodating person, and the, and the competitive person. And here, and this is in the U.S., you know, we're, we're aggressive. You know, we're sort of <laughs> not very well-mannered, you know. And, you know, every time I did a straw poll, over 60%, anywhere from like 60 to 75% of the students felt they were too accommodating. And so there's something about actually learning fighting skills as part of mediation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's, uh, I recall a lot of MMA fighters, mixed martial art fighters, that once they know how to kick someone's ass, they don't just get into bar fights because uh, their body's now a deadly weapon in a way. Uh, so they, and there's a, in traditional martial arts, at least they have uh, ethics that go along with uh, learning this skill set. Um, and there's a certain responsibility to that. And so, yeah, if you know how to have that sort of a UFC of a mind approach and you can have that sports debate and you're good at it, um, that might encourage you also to be good at the, the mediation stuff. Yeah. And, and uh, what, what's, what's coming to mind when you asked that question, David, um, or when you did that suggestion about kind of like the uh, proselytizing media, uh, mediation for like resolving family disputes and whatnot, uh, the personal story came up about how I'm probably a hypocrite. Um, so like, I'm into all this mediation stuff and, you know, I think I'm pretty good at it and I can hold space pretty well, but uh like I won't say who the family members are, but when we have a family get together, there's there's fights. Right? There's there's one side that's sort of Trump, one side sort of like Hillary Biden or whatever, and I'm just pieced out. <laughs> like, I don't want to I don't want nothing to do with this. I'm just sort of this meta guy in the background, even though I have capacity in order to hold space for that conversation, but it's just too exhausting. Um, mm. And and there might be um, when I'm thinking about that, there might be some lack of skill that I have in that situation in order to send subtle invitations. Um, to encourage dialogue rather than just jump in with some mediation approach. And so when you're, when you're, when you were, were, were musing on that idea, um, maybe there's additional skill sets and how to like mediate in the wild, mediate without a container that everyone agrees to, uh, mm -hmm. even if it's just simple invitations or just holding, um, you know, space in a certain way for yourself. Hmm. Mediate in the wild. That's nice. I like that. That's energizing. I, I do think it's the, the question that you're, you're all raising about how is, it, how is it framed? And then David, the question about what happens when the actual skill set is uh, kind of identified with one political perspective, you know? And also, you know, there's also this idea that, you know, mediation really isn't a win-win. Mediation is often a lose-lose that if I, enter, if I enter into it at all, I'm guaranteed to have to give something up and I don't want to. People need to come to understand that giving up is a is a good. It feels good, you know. Like actually, how do how does one how does one be a good winner and experience victory, and how does one experience the pleasure of surrender, you know, and the pleasure of letting go. And like like pleasure and excitement are two of the things that I think would have to be in the workshop. Yeah, I really liked the the idea of getting good at the muscle of argumentation to be able to kind of lay it down like that feels true because otherwise in, in the same way that if you, you can kind of feel that somatically when you're when you're not familiar like take anger as a good example when you're when you're inexperienced with your anger you will get overwhelmed by it like this is one of the practices that that, that I'm sure um, we're familiar with is getting getting friendly with those that's the essence of shadow work is getting friendly or familiar with those parts of ourselves allows us not to play them out unconsciously and i feel like that that partly and it calls back to what we were talking about earlier in the conversation about that it's not necessarily 
the issue that we're dealing with at the moment isn't necessarily the fact that we have conflict, it's that we're increasingly losing the, the context and the, and the, um, the rules. Like that's the sense that I think a lot of people have had over the last four years and more is that it's, it's, it's the, the checks and balances, it's the rules of the game that are being lost and are being stripped away. And I think that, that I mentioned before that Helena and Build Up talk about it's when you've got these sense of identity being framed in a way that excludes or demonizes others. And this, this again comes back to Jonathan Haidt's work. He says, it's not just, you, political polarization is one thing. There's, there's always been a healthy tension and there needs to be a healthy tension. It's when you get to the point where the one side is saying the other side is definitely evil because they think this way. Um, and that, that's, that's interesting. It's sort of the, the sense that developing those skills is necessary in the martial arts sense to feel safe enough to lay them down in a way. That's, yeah, that, those are really interesting. And I do think that, that my experience in training mediators is a lot of mediators are conflict averse. You know, and that's why they're that's why they're becoming mediators. And when, in fact, sometimes from my perspective, what needs to happen is the the argument, the fight, the dispute, the the difference needs to be heightened, not flattened. You know, so he helping people move counterintuitively in a mediation session is a, is a little bit of a hard thing to teach. You know, like let each other have it. Let me see what's really going on here. Wow, this is this is bitter. You know. <laughs> <laughs> as opposed to oh no you know come on everyone let's you know so so will you ever say something like did you hear what he just said about you yes i did it last night i said that was brutal <laughs> <laughs> i said it was super brutal he said oh no i'm sorry i said i'm not asking you to apologize i'm asking you to own it what is it you wanted from that there's some impact you wanted to create through that comment that you just made and i'm just curious if it created the impact you wanted and if it did let's go into it so I do think that humans are very, we're very, very sensitive. We pace each other a lot in terms of conflict. And, um, you know, we back away rather quickly often. I mean, even here, I mean, it's, you know, it's sort of like, I don't know. I feel like I need to whisper. Um, during the election, you know, there are these, these skirmishes between the right and the left. They didn't really last very long. You know, people are clearly not desperate enough to start fighting with each other for in extended periods. They're skirmishes, but they're not. Of course, they could just be warming up. That could be another way to look at that. But um, I was always just noting how they skirmished and then everyone disappeared. Now, that's not good. I mean, I don't know how many different people were killed during the demonstrations uh, this fall. It's not good that that's happening. Anyway, um, yeah. So... The sexiness could be by actually helping people learn how to fight better. Yeah. And I know we're approaching the top of the hour, but the, the thing that's really landing for me is that that point exactly um, getting better at conflict and propositional violence, if you will, will help you be better mediator. And, and I think that is the actual thing that's missing from the whole, you know, integral meta modern game B space is mm -hmm. being good at argumentation. Um, it's like Jordan Hall calls it simulated thinking. People are good in the culture war. They're good at memorizing arguments like shibboleths and just repeating it. Mm -hmm. But from my experience, because I have a philosophy background, I engaged in these like hidden debate clubs in Toronto that were really aggressive. It was mm -hmm. so humbling. Like, man, I don't know shit. <laughs> that's like that that, that, that that hits home really quick if you design the container well to like, so the truth bleeds out. Um, and so being good at argumentation or good enough at it is a humbling experience, which might connect to being good at the mediation. I'd like to see those skill sets combined, you know, because we need both. We need the, the unity of joining and we need the excitement of the debate and even the competitiveness of it, because that's how we grow. It's like watching, you know, 14, 15 year olds on skateboards just constantly outdoing each other. The whole sport evolves because they're 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 honing their skills they're not relaxing and just coming together you know so somehow it has to have both yeah and that also that piece you just shared as well peter brings up for me like one of the one of the points that i've been feeling as well is that there's there's too much kind of conflict avoidance 
And the, the need to sort of steer into discomfort, I think, is a really important one. And certainly from, from all of the, the kind of... We're very, we're very good at kind of bullshitting ourselves or lying to ourselves or finding a kind of comfortable niche. And I feel like part of it in this sort of broader, as you said, like metamodern game B-ish type space is, I think there's a real need to actually steer into that discomfort a little bit more and get those, look for those reflections, look for those opportunities for growth. Um, and I, I, I've been seeing over the last couple of years of sort of observing this space, like th there isn't enough of that. There isn't enough of that. And I think partly it's what I talked about before that once you've got a public profile, it's very difficult to do that. Certainly in public and maybe in private as well, because you get established, yeah. you get identified with a certain position. Yeah. Um, and I, I see kind of people spinning off into different kind of rabbit holes or dead ends or um, stop, t stop growing intellectually and stop growing emotionally and stop growing spiritually and stop growing full stop. And that seems to be like, and my overall sense of this sense of everything having crystallized in the intellectual space, certainly in the public intellectual space, comes back to that feeling of, yeah, everyone's crystallized. And then, then I think part of it is also caused by social media because social media has, has increasingly reflected our worst instincts back to us and our, and our sort of narcissism and our, and our, our fixation around certain bad ideas. And I feel like the whole space has crystallized because I think social media, what it all also does is crystallizes our personality structure over time. Like we get identified with certain positions, we get kind of, we get into public debate, we start positioning ourselves based on, based on different uh, kind of images of ourselves we want to put out there. And I feel like this, yeah, in a, in a, in a macro space, that's where I feel this sense of where's the novelty? Like I don't see the novelty that I that I used to see and used to kind of excite me in the in the kind of wider cultural landscape. I, maybe I'm not just look, not looking in the right places, but this sense of I, I don't see it so much anymore. Well, and and also David, just to build on that, I mean, I would say in the the circles that we tend to be in and the conversations we want to have, there's also this kind of this genuine sort of. Um, merging, you might say, in a way of the psychological spiritual with the intellectual, to where we want to be able to actually apply some of what we're, what we've learned about becoming a, a deeper, more fluid, free human being um, with our idea, with the idea realm, you know, so for instance, let's say, just the issue of shadow, for instance, you know, it would be very common for us in a transformational seminar to do shadow work, Right. But in the intellectual sphere, that doesn't seem to translate in the same way, you know, but what would that be like if we actually picked up the idea we're least attracted to and argued for it? You know, what would happen if another thing that could happen, you know, the, the, the idea that I'm most repelled by, make that argument, debate from that perspective and see what shifts that creates in, in your point of view. And then I think another thing that I think has been useful for me is the human mind is incredible incredibly, oh my gosh, um, what's the word? It's, it's a phenomenal tool, you know? And there have been moments where I've used like a voice dialogue process. So instead of dialogue or instead of debate, I've asked people, everyone to identify with one idea and speak to that idea. Now everyone identify with the opposite idea. Let's all argue the opposite together and see what emerges. Now, let's all identify as wisdom. What is the synthesis of this idea? What is the outcome? What is the practice? I mean, American uh, culture, you know, if we had a philosophy, it was pragmatism. I don't know if it's still that, but pragmatically speaking, what actions would we take based on this incredible synthesis of these two opposing forces that actually all of us can identify with? You know, so there, there are also other tools for argument that I think we, because one of the things that I, in my Zen studies, you know, I was noticing that we always go to mediation with the assumption of two. 
there's always two opposing views and we're basically trying to find some sort of workable integration. But what happened if we actually related to this problem from the mind of one? What would that, and that I could, we could all speak from the dualistic analytic mind or we could become the mind of wholeness and see what emerges from that mind. I mean, this, this mind with a capital M is so remarkable. And then there's a certain way that we're frozen in terms of our own intellect, intellectual techniques, you know, in some ways. I mean, I think postmodernism has been quite um, destabilizing in a certain way to the intellectual tradition, but there should be something really ripe that grows out of that in terms of how we see this, this tremendous tool we have. This tremendous, it's more than a tool. I, I don't, it's a capacity, I guess. You know, we all can see, speak. We could all identify with one part of ourselves right now and just discover a tremendous commonality if we just did that. If I didn't remain Diane and you didn't remain Peter or David, and we all identified as, let's just say, uh, the part of ourselves that deeply cares for human culture. You know, each one of us, what, what would emerge from that identification from the three of us that would be different if we talked about it from our independent identities? So I'm just thinking of creative ways to stir it up, you know. So we're reaching the end of the, the conversation. Peter, did you, did you have anything to wrap up? Uh, I guess closing thoughts and what is alive for me right now uh, was Diane's thought um, about kind of tethering uh, the argumentative skill set with the mediation skill set uh, strikes me as fundamentally right. And having an arena to, to, to practice that, maybe perform that, um, as I mentioned, that sort of underground debate club that we had, it's like we kicked each other's ass, but then we realized that we needed like an aftercare to use like SNM terminology. We needed an aftercare session. And then we, we were doing like active listening, you know, um, in those sessions. And then we had, we fought and we did aftercare. Um, so not only like an arena needed for that, but also, uh, uh, some training for that as well, because they're both distinct skill sets that have, you know, um, distinct ways to learn, learn them. Um, so, and it's kind of exciting too, because there's so much opportunity there. I don't see anyone getting that right, getting either of those, the, the arena and the education right. Um, and so there's a lot of opportunity and creativity, how to frame it, market it and, and whatnot. I think for me, just by way of closing, just to appreciate you both for, for asking this question in a very real way. You know, I think it's something that bothers everybody, but it's another thing to actually hunker down and really give it serious thought and serious consideration. So I just want to appreciate you both for doing that. Our ability to make sense of the world is breaking down. We're making more and more consequential choices with worse and worse sense making to inform those choices, which is kind of running increasingly fast through the woods, increasingly blind. Over the last two years, Rebel Wisdom has interviewed some of the world's top thinkers. Now we've brought them together for an eight-week online course, Sensemaking 101, with Daniel Schmachtenberger, Diane Mushow hamilton John Viveki, Doshin Roshi, and more. Improve your sensemaking, develop your sovereignty, and join a wider community looking to do the same.